today. Um, our speaker today is Phil Thompson. Um, some of you will have overlapped with Phil, most of you not. Uh, he graduated in 2012. And um, so since it's been three years and most of you weren't here then, and those of you who were are old enough that you won't remember this, <laughs> I'm gonna use the same introduction I used for his um, dissertation defense. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good one. Um, <laughs> the funny thing is, is that um, Phil graduated, um, it's North Carolina State, right? Mm -hmm. North Carolina State with a PhD in physics, um, magna cum laude. Not PhD yet. <laughs> bachelor's. 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 <laughs> <laughs> with a bachelor's. Um, some 25 years earlier, I graduated with a bachelor's in physics, magna cum laude. He came to graduate school. We ended up working on sea level. I had gone to graduate school, worked on sea level. After school, after graduate school, I went to the University of Hawaii to do a postdoc with Klaus Berkey, who was the director of the University of Hawaii Sea Level Center, and a professor in the Department of Oceanography. Phil graduated. He went to the University of Hawaii to work with Mark Merrifield, who's a professor and the director of the University of Hawaii Sea Level Center. <laughs> when we both went out there, when we first got there, being postdocs, we had no money, so we stayed in a dorm at the East West Center, the same dorm, mm -hmm. until we could find an apartment. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's the same room or not. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be and creepy. So we've been joking about the only thing left is for when is he going to move to USF? Yeah. <laughs> the problem, though, is that he's never gone anywhere until I left. So, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, I can make that happen. <laughs> he's been here all week though and I gave him a key to my office and I surprised him the other day I came in and he's in there with a tape measure right? <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate uh, Phil has done a wonderful job he's now um, I, I forgot to mention too that after doing the postdoc um, I stayed on and became the director of the YC Level Center as a research faculty member Phil is now in a similar position and the associate director of the University of Hawaii Sea Level Center. And uh, he's doing great work, uh, a lot of it's sea level related, and I'll let him tell you what he's going to talk about today. So please, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, so as Gary mentioned, the last time I was standing right here, I was actually defending my PhD. And uh, I have to admit I'm a little bit conflicted because obviously there's some some wistful nostalgia for all the great times I've had here, but there's also uh, a bit of PTSD, I think, from uh, <laughs> mostly being scared to death of what Bob Weisberg was going to ask me at my <laughs> dissertation. Uh, so it's sitting right there, so I guess if I black out, then it's just a flashback, no worries. Uh, <laughs> seriously, though, it's, it's, uh, it's awesome to be back, and I've already had the chance to catch up with uh, quite a few people, and uh, Gary's been a great host, and it's been a uh, really good week. And um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about 20th century sea level rise. And of course, this is a hot topic not only in Florida, but in climate science in general. And, you know, the 20th century doesn't seem like very long ago, but so I think people would tend to assume that we pretty much know everything there is to know about sea level rise during this time. But there's actually a lot we don't know, and probably a lot of things we won't ever know as well. And so, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about some work that I've been doing to clarify some of the uh, sea level science that's already been out there, and then trying to put some constraints, uh, perhaps, on estimates um, based on some newer sources of information that have only really begun to be utilized in this area. So I'd like to thank my collaborators, Ben Hamilton at Old Dominion University and Felix Landerer at JPL. I saw a flyer in KRC, actually, that uh, Felix is going to be here in a few weeks to give a talk, uh, so you should definitely check that out. Okay, so I think I'll start with uh, what we don't not know, and that is to say that we actually uh, can observe and identify the causes of recent sea level rise incredibly well. We have three uh, impressive observing systems in place that complement each other really well. Uh, we have satellite altimetry that measures the height of the sea surface from space, and the uh, global mean sea surface height from those satellites is here in black. Uh, and the trend in that curve over that time is about three millimeters per year. We also have uh, measurements from the GRACE satellites, 
And uh, they measure time variable gravity, and you can, they can sense the actual transfer of mass from ice sheets on land to the ocean. And this component has a trend of about two millimeters per year during this period. And we also have the Argo array. It's a global array of, of, of passive drifters that can dive and, and give profiles of temperature and salinity. And we can calculate the density change uh, in the ocean, and that has its contribution to sea level rise as well. And that has a trend of about one millimeter per year. And so if we add these together, you see the, the sea level budget is actually closed really well, to well within the source of errors in these measurements, and these curves anyway. And uh, this gives a lot of confidence in um, the present observing system and what we have going forward. If we go back a little bit to the early 1990s, we don't have GRACE, we don't have ARGO, um, but we do have altimetry still, so we have a pretty good idea of the, the overall trend in sea level, which is about 3.3 millimeters per year. We have a nice robust estimate. But before that, uh, sea, level ri sea level rise itself is not really well that, that well constrained. Uh, I think most estimates, if you look in the literature, will give you an uncertainty of something like 0.2 millimeters per year. But the, the estimates themselves vary much, much more than that. And so the uncertainty is probably much larger. These are probably formal errors that underestimate the true error in those curves. And really what we can say is that global sea level rose somewhere between 1 to 2 millimeters per year during the 20th century. And in addition to that, most of the sources of, of sea level rise are actually totally unknown. So this is a slide from the most recent IPCC report showing the sources of sea level rise from 1901 to 1990. Uh, and you see the authors don't even really bother to give you estimates for thermal expansion or the Greenland and Arctic ice sheets. And that's because there simply aren't observations to, uh, to constrain those, those particular sources. But nevertheless, it is really important that we work towards constraining these early estimates of sea level rise because uh, the past may be the best indicator of the future. And so if we are given with our satellite observing systems the current rate of change, if we have a, uh, a reduced rate prior to this, you may think that we, we might be able to see or convince someone that we are on more of an accelerating track. So you might get more future sea level rise. But a greater uh, rate of rise in the past may indicate that we're on a more linear track and we may be in for uh, less sea level rise. So actually, greater sea level, sea level rise in the past may be uh, good news. Um, so of course, this concept and the importance of this, uh, of this curve, this historical sea level curve, is not lost on climate scientists and those who are interested in sea level. And so uh, many people have been interested in this and there's been a lot of uh, estimates of these curves or of historical sea level rise. This is a figure from the blog realclimate.org uh, where one of the authors referred to the growing number of sea level estimates as the zoo of sea level curves. And this isn't even all of them. There are quite a few more they could have put on this plot. And you can already see some of the scenarios that we just talked about where this is the recent rate. All these rates are sort of leveled to, have, to converge here at the, uh, during the altimeter period when we, have, when we have data. But then you, know, you can see some of these have a shallower rate during the, er, during the 20th century. Some have a steeper rate. And so that may have implications for what we can expect in the future. Uh, so why do these estimates vary so widely? And the, shorter, the short answer is that we have to rely on the historical tide gauge network. We don't have the precise uh, satellite measurements of sea level that we have today. And this figure illustrates a lot of the challenges uh, that are presented by working with data, this data set. So in the upper left, uh, these are the trends over the length of the time series, of length of, over the record length, for all the annual mean records in the permanent service for mean sea level database. And then I also have 20 year trends in three different periods here. And the first thing you notice is that these gauges are not distributed homogeneously in either space or time. So you have uh, a lot of gauges clustering around North America, very little in the, uh, uh, along East Africa, for instance. And then also there's a lot of clustering in time. Of course, there's a lot more data available during uh, this, the later 20th century than there would be in the 30s and the 40s. Uh, there are also lots of local effects. You see these, these trends vary very, very differently from place to place. And some of this is just because we have different record lengths of 10 to 100 years. And some of this is local effects like vertical land motion. But also ocean dynamics plays a, a large role as well. So this is a figure showing 20-year trends from the Aviso. Uh, uh, this is a, a product of satellite altimetry. And I've removed the, long, the global mean and then calculated the 20-year trends. And so the cool colors here 
are where sea level is rising slower than the global average, and the warm colors are where sea level is rising faster than the global average. And most of the variation in this map is due to wind-driven circulation changes, both horizontal and vertical. Uh, and so you can imagine that this pattern might look very different in the past, may have a totally different sign. Um, and so if you couple this spatial variability with a constantly evolving tide gauge network, such that you're always sampling different patterns um, in different places, then you can see how piecing together a global average can be quite complicated. Uh, so given these, these challenges, a variety of methods have been developed to combine the tide gauge data with other sources of information, like satellite altimetry, to, to optimal, optimally combine them in some way to get the best estimate of global mean sea level. Uh, some of these methods are listed here. Um, and I think most people have assumed that the differences between these various estimates are due to these methodological considerations, which, with everyone saying my new method uh, is definitely an improvement in some fashion over previous methods. But there's a second and often overlooked difference between these various estimates, and that is despite that every one of these estimates begins with the same or access to the same data set, uh, they all use a different subset of the data. Uh, and these are two, two estimates that I'll focus on in this talk, at least in the beginning. And uh, we're, this latter one uh, includes about 25% more gauges than, than, the, than the Church and White curve. And th this idea th that the data that goes into these estimates of 20th century sea level, of global mean sea level, uh, may be just as important, if not more important, than methodology is something that Ben Hamilton and I wrote a paper on earlier this year. And in that, we highlighted the effect of, of gauge selection on two particular estimates of global mean sea level, Church and White in 2011, and uh, a newer estimate from Hay et al. in 2015. Uh, and I chose these because the, the Church and White is sort of treated as the gold standard of global sea level curves. It's, it's quoted in the IPCC a lot. It's on a lot of websites. But then Hay et al. earlier this year, they made a splash with their estimate because it was published in Nature, and they gave the lowest estimate to date um, of the 20th century rate of change, which, and they also noted that that may imply a greater acceleration in the rate. Uh, so this upper figure shows the, shows the actual global mean sea level curve from each of those estimates. And if you look at the difference between them, what you really see, is it looks more like a step function. You have a constant difference for the, pretty much the first half of the 20th century, followed by a convergence of those two curves during this period, and then uh, essentially very little difference afterwards. So what might be causing this temporal difference or this temporal structure in the difference curve? Well, our assumption here is that the differences in the tie gauge data might be uh, a dominant factor. So let's look at how those two sets of gauges differ. And, and the obvious thing that jumps out at you is that the high latitudes, there's a, there's a big difference. So these are, this is the entire 622 gauge set that was included by uh, uh, Carling Hay and her estimate. And then the black ones are the ones that are also in Church and White. The red ones are unique to the Hayward construction. Uh, this is the time series that go into those reconstructions. So this is the curves from Church in White and Black, and the curves from Hay et al. in Red. And uh, I think it's fairly easy to see that the more data you start to include, the lower quality the data becomes. You can see that the, the distribution of, of the curves in Black is much tighter than the distribution of the curves in Red. Uh, but then how do we assess the effect of these various data choices on the estimate of global sea level. Uh, well, both Church and White and Hay use pretty sophisticated uh, reconstruction me methodologies to calculate global mean sea level. Uh, and the result is that the weight given to any particular data point varies not only from gauge to gauge, but also varies in time. And so the impact of individual records or subsets of the records uh, can be pretty difficult to, to suss out. So, to cut through the sort of opaqueness of, the, of these methodologies, we just worked with simple arithmetic averages on various subsets of the data to see if we could find this temporal structure here uh, in subsets of the data. So we started with gauges that were common to both sets, and that's here again in black. So these gauges were in both sets. And then we successfully, successively added gauges that were unique to the Hay reconstruction and attempted to capture this temporal structure. And I won't bother you with the uh, entire process of trying different various sets of data. I'll just show you the result. And it turns out, maybe not surprisingly, that if you, uh, the choice to include these high latitude gauges by Hay et al. Uh, can account for majority of this difference. So what I've done here is this is the 
this black curve in the lower panel is the distances again. The red curve is now actually the average sea level from both black and red gauges, uh, and then minus the average of the sea level from only the black gauges. So this is in a very simple fashion, simulates what you might expect the variability to be just to, to the gauges in red um, on the difference in the reconstructions. Okay, so in this analysis on its own does not really indicate if one estimate is more likely to represent reality, however, so we need to go a step further. And I'll move on to some current work uh, that I've been working on to assess the validity of these various reconstructions. Uh, prior to satellite altimetry, estimates of 20th century global rise were uh, made using a small number of long, high-quality gauges uh, for the reason that records shorter than about 60 years were considered to be corrupted by that decadal variability and that spatial information or that spatial patterns of, of sea level change that you saw in the altimetry. But then there was a, a shift uh, with Don Chambers' paper in 2002, actually, uh, towards including more shorter records uh, where this was made possible because we had a satellite altimetry and we had uh, the spatial information. So if you know from the satellite data that you have when sea level is high in one area and it's low in another, uh, then you can use the spatial information from the satellites to then uh, remove that, that regional part, that, that regional part of the variability and hopefully leave behind just the common part that is due to global change. Um, and so in theory, that should improve estimates of the long-term trend by reducing the decadal noise and the spatial sampling error. But as I've just showed you, it seems like the more complicated the reconstruction methods get and the more we have, um, uh, it doesn't seem to be reducing the uncertainty very much. And, we, uh, and these methodologies, as I just showed you also, was that they're very sensitive to the data that you input into them. So the methodologies must not be totally accounting for that regional and decadal variability perfectly. And uh, so uh, the data that you put in is then accounting for, much, for many of these differences. And so I think there's a need to try to develop ways to distinguish between these various estimates and then maybe assess their validity. And then to do this, I'd like to go back to the basics, so to speak, and look at um, the methods that were used pr prior to altimetry. So prior to the development of these reconstruction techniques, uh, uh, we, uh, we looked at the best and the longest records to get our information about global sea level. And I want to focus in on the long-term trend and try to use the long-term trend itself as a metric to assess the validity of these reconstruction estimates. With the idea that being, if you use the longest, um, well, the idea is that, you know, the longest and highest quality records uh, have their own set of limitations. And you can, in fact, get a reasonable estimate of probably the long-term trend. You lose out on some spatial and decadal information. But you should expect that the reconstructed trends uh, uh, should differ probably a little bit because they do include additional information, shorter records, spatial information. But we should be able to at least show that there's a reasonable probability that the trends in the long records and the trends from the global estimates, these reconstructions, are calculated from the same ocean. Uh, and, uh, well, if the, trend is not, if the trend in the reconstruction is not statistically consistent with the trends in these best and longest records, then this may indicate that there's a problem in getting the estimate correct. So I use this term back to the basics loosely, though, however, because uh, this is not maybe as simple as it might seem. And the reason is that when you start to look at long records, uh, these are the trends in millimeters per year from 75, or all 75 records in the Permanent Service for Mean Sea Level Archive that have more than 70 years of data. And right away you see the problem, and these are trends over 1901 to 1990, is that we're trying to distinguish between global trends that are one to two millimeters per year, but the trends in the individual records themselves are plus minus five, plus minus 10 millimeters per year. And I think the first trick here then is to realize that not all of these trends are equally representative of ocean variability. Uh, they're not. And then we need to figure out which ones of these are the best for this type of analysis. So then, what does constitute a high quality long record? Uh, well, I'll start with those 75 to begin with, those 75 long records that have 70 years plus of data. 
And then uh, the second criterion is that I, uh, I tossed out any gauges that have a GIA correction, so a correction due to glacial isostatic adjustment that is more than half the magnitude of the sea level trend itself in the, in the, in the tide gauge record. So if you're not uh, familiar with what GIA is, this is a schematic that I made to illustrate this concept. Uh, so during the last glacial maximum, uh, when the ice sheets reach their maximum size, the weight of the ice actually displaces the mantle beneath the glacier and it flows slowly out from beneath the glacier and creates a bulge in the far field in the actual uh, land itself. Uh, this, so then in the present day, as the ice has melted, uh, this, uh, the mantle has tried to flow back and, be in, and get back into equilibrium, but the mantle is so viscous and that, that process occurs so slowly that this, uh, this flow is still occurring today. And so this process, this ver the vertical land motion uh, associated with this flow, this return flow of the mantle, affects the calculations of our trends in the tide gauges. So where the land is falling, even if the absolute sea level rise stays the same, where the land is falling, the tide gauge would uh, observe a sea level rise, and where the, sea and the land is rising, the tide gauge would observe sea level fall. So that left me with 45 gauges, and then I just I removed two more gauges because we wanted to remove any records that had uh, gaps longer than five years. Oftentimes, when you have a large gap, that indicates there's been a level shift or, or a, a movement of the gauge or something, so we didn't want to deal with that. So we just removed those two gauges that had gaps longer than five years. And then the most painstaking part of this was then I looked at these 43 gauges, and I went through the literature, and I tried to find any places where they mentioned that uh, these time series of sea level might be related to uh, vertical land motion, or at least uh, that might be a big component of what the variability uh, is, the variability in the record. So this could be due to groundwater extraction, uh, mining, uh, tectonics, hydrocarbon e extraction is big in the Gulf of Mexico. All of those processes can cause uh, trends in your data that have nothing to do with ocean variability. And so when I did that, I was left with just 22 records. So these are the locations of the 22 gauges that I, I picked out, and I'll be using these going forward. Uh, note particularly, particularly that they are not distributed uniformly, and so you definitely would not want to assume that the errors in the trends in these gauges are independent by any means. Uh, so here are the trends then from those 22 records over 1901 to 1990. Their mean value is almost 1.8 millimeters per year, which if left as they are, would be on the high side of those trends from the reconstructions. There's also quite a bit of scatter you see still. But then if I make the